Well, hello there, motherfuckers, and welcome to your Raw review. So, a post-Survivor Series review. How could you possibly follow up such a disappointing finish, you know, with a, a Raw? Could it be any better? Could it be any worse? Well, my money's on the ladder, and so, and so should yours. We started off the show with Stephanie McMahon. What, what a beautiful way to start off the show. Like, like we haven't heard enough of her as of late. From her screaming in the face of all the divas to her basically detesticalizing uh, Kurt Angle several weeks in a row. I mean, how much worse could it get? Another dose to Stephanie. Uh introduces Triple H, Kurt Angle comes out, gets in his face, and, you know, Kurt Angle says if he ever dares do anything like that again, you know, uh, he's going to kick his ass and his job doesn't matter. So so here's the thing, you know, the next time that happens, it, did you notice that line? The next time, well, what about this time? How about the time on the pay-per-view, you know, like last night? How about that? You know, we're not going to get any follow-up to that. Kurt's just like, oh, next time, next time, uh, you know, I'll get you for that. That's, you know, that's not realism right there. That's not uh, making any sense once again. Wouldn't Kurt just come down there? Shouldn't he just run down to the ring and just beat on Triple H, lock him in the ankle lock? Wouldn't that make a lot more sense than, oh, you know, next time you do something like that? Uh yeah, I'm not really understanding the logic there. So what what's what are we gonna get now? Are we gonna get like these little teases of Angle and Triple H? They're not gonna really interact until the eventual WrestleMania match. Is that how it's gonna be? You know, and once again, it's gonna be really funny. We're going to go to WrestleMania, and probably the only match we're gonna end up looking forward to is maybe if they have another Undertaker match. And Triple H and uh, Kurt Angle, two guys in their late 40s who, who wrestled in their prime 15 years ago. That's who we have to look forward to. It's pretty insane. You know, I'm, I'm listening at Survivor Series. Kurt Angle wrestled 18 years ago. And I'm just sitting there thinking to myself, do you realize that even The Rock... Stone Cold, all these other wrestlers throughout time didn't even wrestle that long. You know, I think even if you add Shawn Michaels' name in there, he hasn't even wrestled as many years as that. I, I mean, it's I'm not knocking it, Try to get as much as Kurt out of him as you can. I mean, it's not like you've got any other stars. It's not like you've got anybody worth the damn on this roster. You're not even trying to build up anybody. Might as well use the guy's that you already have. Now, Kurt is a lot smaller. He's slower in the ring noticeably, but, you know, I, I guess, you know, the match will probably be pretty good at the pay-per-view. They're probably going to build it nonsensically, but, you know, that's what you've come to expect. If you're going to watch a WWE pay-per-view, prepare yourself for bad build. Prepare yourself for storylines that are not even consistent in the least bit. You know, uh, case in point, the big storyline between Undertaker and Shane McMahon. Look at that retrospectively. You know, it's like you, you can't even piece together what even makes sense even a little bit in that storyline. So look for a very convoluted way to wrestle. I mean, anyway, let, let, let's get down to this some, some more. So you got Jason Jordan hits the ring. Says he wants a match with Triple H. I say book it. Instead, we get a match with um, with Braun Strowman. Well, why not have that match right then and there? And then you could have had that brawl between Kurt Angle and Triple H. You could have broke out during or after the match, whenever you want to do it. Another missed opportunity. So we're going to get a very obvious Strowman Jordan match. You know, oh, is Jason Jordan going to win it? I, I don't think so. So what is the point of even booking something like that? You know that they're not going to book, book Jordan to win that match. So why even bother? Why even bother putting him on there? You know, against Strowman. Why, why even have this match? 
it's punishment because he dared Triple H, you know, he dared to, dared to challenge the almighty Triple H, so everyone has to be punished. You know, Strowman is being used as a punishment tool, kind of like Teddy Long and The Undertaker. Remember that shit every single time using The Undertaker as a way of punishing the heels on SmackDown? Uh, you know, Strowman should be doing more than this after the pay-per-view. Instead of wrestling Jason Jordan in the thrown-together match, you know. Um, and Strowman went, headed down to the ring to got in Triple H's face. Um, Triple H slowly backed away. We're probably going to get that match in some incarnation. I don't know how they're going to manage this. One match might take place at the Rumble. One will take place at Mania. Whichever comes first, Strowman, Triple H, Triple H angle. We're probably going to get both those matches. It's pretty crazy that even Triple H knows that the product, he's, in, he's partly in charge of this product. He knows that it sucks so bad. He knows that it is so damn terrible that he has to insert himself into several pay-per-views, into several Raws, because he realizes there's no star power on the show. So how about that, Triple H, huh? How, how about Fuckboy Balor? How about that, right? Oh, the guy is there to attract all the women. <laughs> looking at in the crowd. I don't see any women. None attractive ones anyway. And I'm not seeing this potential. A big star. You, you know, so you could kind of see why nobody really makes it to the big time anymore, especially when you've got stars like Balor and this is who Triple H views. Like, keep this in mind about this. This is what I'll never understand. So, Neville, here's a guy who left the company. Neville. You see the guy, impressive build. You think that's what Triple H would look for, right? Being a, um, a fitness enthusiast himself, the guy is incredibly jacked, even well into his 40s. He's just as in shape as he was in his 30s. So, the guy works really hard. So, you think he'd appreciate a guy like Neville. That guy could wrestle, he could talk, and he's got the build. Then you look at Balor, you know, he's not a, a horrible build, a toned body, no mic skills, wrestling skills, or, you know, I don't understand why everybody thinks Balor is such a, a, a great wrestler, stomping around like a three-year-old. Every time I see the coup de gras bullshit move, I still can't believe how he hit Cena with that. That just annoyed me to no end. Seeing Cena taking that ridiculous move. It's even, it's not, I'm not just picking on Balor about that move. I'm also picking on Cesaro and Del Rio and all the other people. Who was it also? Davey Richards and the, the Wolves and TNA and ROH also doing that stupid ass looking move. It, it just looks plain goofy. A single stomp with one foot looks good. But jumping in the air like a fucking maroon and just, you know, planting both your feet down, it just looks pretty stupid. It looks like, you know, you're trying to be Mario, you know, but this ain't no fucking Mario game. It's wrestling. Uh, so there's no place for such a stupid looking move. But my whole point here is why exactly is Triple H putting so much stock in certain people when... He should just look in the mirror. He looks like a star. Now, this guy is full of bullshit up to his eyeballs. But the thing is, he should know what makes a star. He is one. So why the hell does he put all these other jobbers, you know, why would he want to be in the ring with the Finn Balor and a guy that is tremendously out of shape like Samoa Joe? I'll never understand that mentality. Let, 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 let's move on already. We're almost 10 minutes into the video and I haven't even got past the first segment. But I can't help myself sometimes. I, I have to rant on it. Um, oh, the first match of the night. Fat Boy Samoa Joe, the purple nurple um, instigator, I will say. Because, you know, Samoa Joe is... Got them ripe and prime nipples always showing. I mean, like, 
for first of all, okay, so let's just get past the, the boring part. The match, he, he beat some, the Smarks love it. Hooray! Two, you know, uh, you know, guys who were indie guys, ROH guys in the match. Joe chokes out, um, uh, fuck boy with, 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 with the, uh, coquina clutch. He goes down. Okay, wonderful, fabs. Just look at Joe. Look at this guy, fat and disgusting. Every single thing that Scott Steiner said about him is 100% absolutely grade A true. Fat, unappealing looking. Just like, why would I want to watch this guy? And not only does he have an unpleasant look to him, but he also has the most ridiculous attire. He's been wearing those same fucking shorts since 2002. It's time to get a new pair of fucking pants already. Get a new pair of trunks. And the trunks look even goofier on them. They're all like looser than they were in the past. I don't know. There's something different. It looks more like a skirt this time. The, you know, the, the, the legs, the pant legs just look so loose. I, I don't know, but just there's a lot of shit about Joe that bothers me. Right down to his generic monotone promo style. The fact that he does the same exact moves for fucking, you know, 15 years already, it's getting a bit tiresome. And yes, I'm not even exaggerating with the 15 years. The first time I heard about Joe, it was 2002. It was Ring of Honor. Or he was in developmental in OVW. Whatever the hell it was, Joe's been doing the same shtick, the same crap for, for over a decade already. A decade and a half. No exaggeration. We're at the end of 2017. Soon to be 2018. It is time to change and branch out a bit, Joe. It is time to fucking get a bit more personality. The old, timey, super serious wrestling promo is boring. You've got TV shows with charismatic characters. You know, in, in comparison, this is like a joke. You're acting like a wrestler. And it, this has no place in the current landscape. When you've got colorful personalities like Enzo, you know, on the same show on Raw, and you have to look at Samoa Joe, and it's just, it's so generic. Like, you're looking at a colorful character like Enzo coming out, you, you know, looking like, a, like a, a star, you know, with a long robe, sunglasses, crazy hair, you know, trying to get himself noticed. And Samoa Joe is just over there with his boring, multicolored trunks. What a fucking buffoon. I, I seriously, everything about this guy, I never understood it from day one. What is so appealing? He worked stiff. This was what I used to read back in the day on the message boards prior to YouTube. He worked stiff, guys. That's why he's a great wrestler. He had a fight. I remember that. Five-star match, yeah, an Iron Man match with CM Punk in uh, in Ring of Honor. And all the fanboys simultaneously had an orgasm. And they wouldn't shut the fuck up about the stupid five-star Meltzer-rated uh, Iron Man match that they had. Big fucking deal. It, 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 they made like this match was the best match of all time, that it was going to change lives, it was going to change the landscape of wrestling, WWE's garbage, Ring of Honor is where it's at, wonderful, Fa fabulous, you know, an indie match that barely anybody watched and we're all supposed to get excited about it, give Joe a medal, make him president of the United States, you know, anoint him to the highest office in the land because there's nobody better than Samoa Joe, ah, what a, what a crock of crap. Already, I am sick and tired of hearing how great Joe is. He was never that great. He's all right. He's decent. But this amazing, excellent worker? No, that's never been the fact. Sorry, I'm, you know, I'm just watching this match, seeing him at Survivor Series. I just have to rant on the guy. I'm getting so sick and tired of all the fanboys uh, always trying to put this guy over. 
If he was so great and so over, you wouldn't have to try so hard to put him over every single night. Um, Anderson and Gallows, the best thing since sliced bread. <laughs> they don't even have a match. You know what they're doing tonight? Hawking merchandise for WWEshop.com. You know, and they're selling this Nerdometer shirt, which is so ridiculous. This shirt makes no sense at all. I'm thinking to myself, if you wear a shirt to school or you wear a shirt in just broad daylight that says Nerdometer, they don't know that that is referring to Gallows and Anderson calling people nerds. People are going to think that you're calling yourself a nerd by wearing a stupid nerdy shirt like that. It's like, uh, it's fucking stupid. Like, who's going to buy that? And who would buy a Gallows and Anderson t-shirt? Like, seriously, who would spend money on a, on a two-bit tag team like that on their t-shirt? Um, probably a nerd. <laughs> uh, Kurt Angle is backstage with Jason Jordan. Pretty decent segment. Jordan was all nervous. He says that he's injured. Angle says, you know, I thought you said that you weren't injured. Then he kind of, you know, Kurt Angle kind of pep talks him, says that he's, you know, wrestled uh, bigger guys than him. You know, he wrestled bigger guys in the Olympics, you know, uh, and Jason Jordan kind of gets fired up. Um, decent enough little segment interaction between these guys. Uh, Asuka defeated Dana Brooke. What, what, what is, you know, what is the, the okay, I'm not going to go into the giant rant. I've already done several in this video. We're never going to get the review done. It's going to be an hour-long review if I keep talking about Asuka, 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 ask her about it, whatever the fuck her name is. That girl with the, the hair. I mean, what what is so great about her? She does a Tajiri kick. Wonderful. Can we just get to Jerry? Oh, that's right. You released them. Um, you know, maybe Asuka would have been interesting as maybe a valet for Tajiri if they maybe didn't, you know, fire the guy. Um, that could have been nice. But instead, we're just getting a wrestler. And why are we supposed to care about Asuka? Uh, I don't know. She smiles a lot. She screams. But, um... You know, I'm watching her on Survivor Series, and, you know, during the pep talk, she's, ah, ah, ah. she didn't even go, ah, she didn't even say anything. She's just nodding like a trained chimpanzee. Uh, I mean, you've got to be kidding me. Like, this is the Oscar that everybody rants and raves about. I am, and I'm so sick of the argument, they work stiff, so go watch Japan. Why are you even wasting your time with WWE? If you want to see that stiff work style so much, better yet, if you want to see real shit, go watch MMA. It actually is real. You know, what? what is with people like? They want to see other wrestlers get injured. Do you really want to see Seth Rollins, like, breaking his leg again? You know, to doing some dangerous shit? I mean, is that what you want to see? You won't be happy until every single wrestler has broken their body. And Asuka is going to hurt somebody. She's going to hurt one of these wrestlers one day. She's going to kick one of them in the head. They're going to get badly injured. She's going to give somebody a concussion. And then they're going to have to start looking at some of this stiff work. Oh, the Naka Murphys of the world. Oh, the Oscars, you know, praise these wrestlers. They're so wonderful because they're wrestling in a fake form of entertainment with real kicks. What is the point of that? The whole point of a wrestling match is to entertain without really hurting the opponent because, you know, it's not real. It's entertainment, um, so no one's really supposed to get hurt at the end of the day. Once in a while, you throw in a little dangerous stunt, but the thing is to try to really not... You see, the object of a, of a wrestling match from a, you know, from a kayfabe standpoint is to hurt the other wrestler as much as you can in order to get a pinfall win or a submission. But in actuality, you know, in reality, where the Dave Meltzers of the world don't live... The actual goal of a match is to entertain 
and get to the end of the match without fucking killing each other. And try to work as safe as possible. Try to take care of your co work Instead, you know, the fans are bloodthirsty nowadays and they've forgotten that it's a, it's fake and they think that it's real and they want it to be as real as possible. And they're watching something, wanting it to be something that it's not. I mean, if that's not counterproductive, I mean, the, the funny thing is that WWE is, is catering to it. Why? You know, when you're getting diminishing returns, isn't it time to finally take a look at you know, what these goofballs are asking for. They want you to hurt your talent. You know, j just so they can chant, this is awesome. You know, the thing is, they're chanting, this is awesome. And half the time, the shit ain't even awesome. You know, the, it, it, it's just that they want to have an excuse to put themselves over and chant really loud like a bunch of goofballs. That's what it's all about. So, you know, I'm not really seeing this whole Asuka appeal. And when she gives somebody a concussion... The whole the whole Asuka experiment is going to go up in smoke. Just you watch. Um, we had some Miz TV with the Shield on. Um, they said they're, you know, Shield says they're going to get their tag titles back. Roman Reigns says that, you know, he feels left out. He wants a title, so he's challenging the Miz for the title. Roman Reigns, three-time world champion, has beaten... Pretty much all there is to beat. He's beaten Triple H. He's beaten Roman Reigns. I mean, he's, yeah, he beat himself. He beat The Undertaker, I mean. Um, he's beat John Cena. There's nobody else. I mean, he, he beat The Miz like a couple of weeks ago, didn't he? For like a, a non-title match or something. So it's like, what can he get out of winning this title? We'll get to that in a little bit. Um, Matt Hardy is giving a little pep talk to Jason Jordan. You know, I don't know. To me, this just kind of seemed a bit disjointed. He's, uh, Jason Jordan is asking advice from Braun Strowman, uh, how, you know, to go, how to go about a match. I mean, I don't even remember Matt Hardy even wrestling Braun Strowman. You know, why doesn't he go to... Roman Reigns for advice. No, Matt Hardy? Matt Hardy wasn't even on the Survivor Series main card. And you're going to... And also, this this like went on way too long. It looked like Matt Hardy was just, you know, reading off a cue card like a robot like this. I mean, just, I have wrestled many big men. I have wrestled Big Show. I have wrestled, uh, uh, you know, Kane, uh, you know, Brock Lesnar. Yeah, I mean, this is the same guy that was doing Broken Matt in TNA. This is the same guy in Deleter Decay. This is the same guy from, from the final deletion, the same one that, you know, broke new ground in the wrestling world. I, I mean, uh, it doesn't seem like the same guy. He's still got the same hairstyle, the same weird highlight in his hair. But, you know, this doesn't seem like the same charismatic individual I was watching about a year ago, and now he's cutting some boring ass promo backstage, some uh, giving advice to a rest about a wrestler that no one even remembers that he wrestled against that person, and it sounded like overly scripted cue card read or something like that along those lines. Um, uh, oh, I skipped over a match actually. Dean Ambrose defeated Sheamus. Uh, after that little segment, and I, you know, this is probably why I skipped over it. None the right home about Ambrose beat Sheamus. We've already seen that match a thousand times. Why are we going to do it again? Uh, let, let, let's just move on. Alexa Bliss um, is asking who's our next challenger going to be. You know, she's uh, beating, you know, um, she was taking Charlotte to the limit. She was saying that people were in, you know, she doesn't need people's recognition telling her that she did well, that she came close to winning. And uh, all the all the women start coming out of the back. You got Alicia Fox, Sasha Banks, Mickey Jane, you know, all taking turns. Could they get through one women's segment without having to show all the women? Is that possible? 
like I said that, you know, at least they don't do what they do on SmackDown, where you've got three girls over here and three girls over there, and then you've got Shane McMahon or um, or Daniel Bryan in the center of the girls. You know, at least they don't do that same rinse and repeat shit, but they do too many of these styles of promos. And this is a style of promo that I've only seen in the PG era, to be quite honest. And it started later on, you know, like 2012 or so, where, you know, somebody comes out the starter promo, that brings somebody out, then that brings another person out. Yes, they did it in the opener, but at least, you know, it made a bit more sense. Now we have to get everybody in. Before we know it, we have a fade or four-way match. And Paige returns. And there you go, folks. Paige is back. Um, she finally returns, and, you know, do I, like, really miss Paige? Quite frankly, really, no. Um, you know, Paige does look like a star, but quite frankly, you know, since Charlotte's come along and Alexa Bliss, Paige is kind of, like, doesn't seem as good as she used to, I'm just saying. You know, not, no knocking Paige, talented girl and everything. Um, she brought along two other girls, uh, what are their names, uh, Mandy, uh, Mandy Moore, yeah, and Cruella DeVille, Sonya DeVille, Cruella DeVille, let's, let's just say that, the Mandy girl was hot, I see what culture is, you know, comparing her to Trish Stratus, I don't know, the other girl is some type of lesbo, um, she, she looks like, one of these other uh, UFC fighters that I've seen. Um, obviously, they're kind of going for that, probably copying off of that type of look, wh wh whatever it is. So you got this Cruella DeVille and Mandy Moore. You know, she looks a lot different than how she used to look in those pop videos. I'm just saying, but uh, you got these two girls and they're standing next to her. We have no idea who they are. Um... You know, they go down to the ring. They start beating up all the divas. And Alicia Fox r runs out of the ring. Backstage, they beat Alexa Bliss up. And I have to say about this, um, Alexa Bliss just, like, you know, got her ass kicked back there. There's something about the women. I've said this. The, during the backstage segments, it seems like the women rough each other up a lot more than the men do. Like, the men, it looks like pussy shit compared to what the women do. The women are, like, jamming each other's head against the metal shutters, and, you know, the men are like, eh, you know, it's kind of pathetic in comparison. Um, so, you know, Paige is back. Uh, some people are going to be really happy. There's a lot of guys on here, and, you know, uh, you know 18, 19-year-olds or whatever that love Paige, they dream about Paige. They fantasize about Paige. I mean, like, enough. You know, it's, it's, she's not that great. Like I've said, we have better women on the roster. And, and haven't you guys cheated on Paige already with your beloved Asuka? Haven't you moved on to the uh, the Japanese persuasion here on YouTube? I, you know, I see a lot of people not talking about Paige lately. She returns, and all of a sudden, people want to talk about Paige. Huh? Yeah, I don't know. I wasn't, like, that excited. But I know a lot of people are, so yay. Um, so I guess that's who Alexa Bliss is going to face. Um, Braun Strowman the, um, and Jason Jordan, you know, they had their little match. It ends in about a minute. Uh, Kane comes in with a chair, beats up Strowman, and does the Undertaker thing with the chair, jams his throat onto the ring post, which, you know, it was a good move, a little throwback to, to Taker there. Um, Strowman is refusing help. He starts, you know, uh, going back up the entrance ramp. Uh, the Zo the the Zo train gets beat by a bunch of two o five live jobbers. Um, you know, here's the thing: it's like you you've got this team they're trying to put together that you know Enzo is like the leader; he's the champion of the whole show, and you want to try to put the champs, you know, 
hand-picked team together. You know, you want to try to get them over. Instead, have them lose. Have them lose to a bunch of boring jobbers. Rich Swan, the old, you know, all these guys that are on there, Mufasa, the Lion King guy. You know, all these wrestlers are super generic as hell. And they're, they're boring guys. And, and so you're going to try to put them over. So you can see they're putting these guys with Enzo to try to get them over a bit more. So these are the hand-picked guys. You could kind of see that these guys look a bit more like stars than, than the baby faces do. You know, they went with Gulak, who has kind of shown a little bit of promise. You know, he, he knows how he can talk on the mic. He knows if he acts a bit goofy, you know, um, he could be entertaining. So they, they see that. That's why they selected guys. They picked Tony Nese, who's obviously got the best body out of the bunch now that Neville's not there. So, you know, but but why make these guys job out here? I understand they haven't been a team for that long. They haven't had a lot of matches. Why are you going to have these guys lose here if you're trying to put them over? Um... Matt Hardy interrupted Elias playing in the ring. Uh, I don't know. This felt kind of flat. And Elias is running away from a one-armed man. Elias has a freaking guitar. And, he, and Matt Hardy has one arm. One good arm. And Elias, a healthy guy, he's running away from Matt Hardy. He's twice the size of Matt Hardy. How the hell does that make any fucking sense whatsoever? How pathetic did that make Elias look? You know, you want to give him a win on the pay-per-view, but the very next, well, the pre-show anyway, and then the very next night you're having the guy run away. Every single heel has to be a chicken shit heel. No exceptions here, right? Every single heel's got to run away from the baby face. That's how it goes. You know, no, like I said, no exceptions. No deviations from that rule. You know, if you're uh, a heel, you got to run away from the baby face. What, what a bunch of boring, connected dots, cookie-cutter bullshit booking that is. And they, they, they live or die by that. And then in the main event, Roman Reigns defeated The Miz. And why do I have a problem? Oh, Brad, you're going to complain your beloved Roman Reigns won the Intercontinental title. Here's the thing. Because I don't like the S.H.I.E.L.D. reunion. I think it is a waste of fucking time. I'm, I'm saying this every week now till I'm blue in the face. This guy has already done everything there is to do. Including now winning every single goddamn title that there is. You know, he wins the world title two times. And then they get the idea, oh, you know what? Let's give him the U.S. title. They, and then he goes back and wins the world title. Then we go again, and, and, and he's winning the intercontinental title now. Why does he need that title? He's already won the world title three times. What is the point of, of him holding a lesser title? Oh, it's the workhorse title. Oh, is it? Like, okay, because they gave it that name. What, what is the point of winning a secondary title? I'm not really understanding this. The Macho Man won the Intercontinental title. But then he won the World title. After that, he didn't go back to winning the Intercontinental title. It, you know, what, what are we doing here? You know... It doesn't make any sense. Why would the guy win the title, a world title, and then settle on a secondary belt? Why is he not challenging Brock Lesnar? Do they even think about this? Now, it's understandable for a guy in the Miz's position because he has the intercontinental title. He's going to defend it. He hasn't been in the world title picture for a while. They've made it... Pretty clear that they want to keep Miz at that upper mid-card level. So, you know, that's not a problem. But Roman Reigns, you want to put this guy over. Undertaker, John Cena, all these guys, and you want to have him beat the Miz for the IC title. What the hell was the point of ending that 
historically long reign just to give it to a guy who's already won every other belt. Because you know why? They know it wouldn't be but you know, good to put the belt on anybody else. They don't really have anybody else that they want to put the belt on. And you notice that. But if they believed in Balor so much, if they believed in the beloved fuck boy, why why is he not the intercontinental title? If they loved Fat Boy Samoa Joe so much, why is he not intercontinental? Because Roman Reigns is good. They want to put it on good guys that they know you know are um charismatic and look like stars. We get that, but there's no point in putting the belt on a guy that has already worn a title that is superior to that title. I will never understand that mentality. They've done it a couple of times in the past, but now they always done it. They've done it with AJ. They've done it with Kevin Owens. They've done it with Jack Swagger. They've done it with uh, uh, Dean Ambrose. They've done it with Seth Rollins. Um, you know these guys winning titles. I mean, like you know, Seth Rollins didn't win a, a you know a singles title after that, but he won the tag titles. He went back to being in a tag team. Like, what is this going backwards? Roman Reigns broke free of the Shield so he could become a singles star. The same thing goes for Ambrose and Seth Rollins. Just because those guys couldn't get over doesn't mean that Roman should have to come back into the fold just so everybody could be over again. You know, th then that's creative's fault. This is lazy, lazy, lazy fucking booking. They couldn't come up with anything. Was it so hard to make Dean Ambrose into a lunatic? They did it with Al Snow. They did it with Mick Foley. So, you know, I mean, like, well, go ahead and even recycle some of that material, for God's sakes. They couldn't even be creative enough to recycle that material. You could do it with Al Snow and Pete, and some people who didn't watch in the past might not even remember half that shit. Might not even have seen that shit. And, and, and you could actually do that. You wouldn't even have to try, really. You could just copy stuff. But they're, they're too inept to even do that. I mean, truly unbelievable. I mean, they, like I said, they can't be creative enough to actually copy somebody else's work. And and, and Seth Rollins, I mean, you know, he was kind of starting to get over as a heel, and now he's this lame, generic, vanilla baby. I mean, how can you get any more vanilla, boring, or generic than Seth Rollins really at this point? It'd be impossible. Roman Reigns was catching fire. He's hot off the heels of a win against John Cena. And where do you go from here? Right back to where you started from in the tag team that broke up. And it doesn't make any sense. We've already had our nostalgia trip. We already had our several matches with the Shield. And, you know, so now Roman has a singles title. Okay, so it's like, so, so why now is he... Back in the Shield, if he's got the singles title now, it's time to move on. Time to move away from the Shield thing. I thought it was just going to be an experiment, but it's not. They're still going with this shit. They are still jamming the Shield down everybody's throat once more. We've already seen all the Shield has to offer. How many six-man tag matches must we sit through before we could get back to the program of Roman Reigns. I, I mean, they were doing a good job. They went through all that trouble of having, you know, thank God they're having Roman. I got scared. I said the first time that Roman returned, he was silent. I thought they were going to make him the silent big man again. Thankfully, they're having him talk, if anything, doing more talking than even Ambrose and Rollins. But still, I wanted to see where the next stage in the Roman Reigns uh, experiment where that was going to go. And they had the perfect opportunity. After Roman Reigns caught that virus and he was out for several weeks, he should have came back and he should have been a heel. He should have said, why didn't you mention me? And I don't know if it's because WWE was planning that and canceled that out at the last minute, or it's just that they're fucking assholes and they didn't acknowledge that the guy was out. 
being sick or, you know, wish him a good, uh, a get well message or anything like that. I, I, I don't know. Um, so, yeah, this show, you know, what, what can I say? You start off the show, you could have a big brawl between two big stars and you get nothing. Then you end the show with a meaningless title win. You end the big title reign, and it's like, you know, oh, Brad, you complain. But I just gave you the reasons why he shouldn't have won that IC title. Doesn't make any sense. No point. Just so you could call him a Grand Slam champion? Is that a reason to take the belt off the Miz after like a whole year of holding it? Anyway, guys, there you go. There's your raw review. This has been your Y. WC champ, sign it out.